Welcome to the EKG Guy. My name is Dr. Anthony Cashew. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Now, either you're coming back for another case, which is awesome, or it's your first time. Either way, so glad you could join us today. Um, now, we're going to be doing the cases right from our free practice uh, site where you can have registered for free. So uh, many of you are already on it, but if not, this is uh, the site right here, practice.ekgguy.com. So simply go there. You could register for free, get started, and uh, we'll get through this case. Now, I know there's many of you, and it's always amazing to see those that continue to follow us. Follow us on Facebook. There's now over you know, 1.3 million of you. So uh, truly a blessing. Never thought this would happen. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you in the case. So here we have an ECG obtained from a 64-year-old asymptomatic female, and there's a, quite a few important findings, or at least a few main ones that we want to take away, okay? Now, first, you want to notice that there's, when we look at if the presence of sinus rhythm is present, well, look at the upright P waves we see in lead 2. So lead 2, we see those clear upright P waves down here in the rhythm strip. Same thing, all these P waves are upright. In AVR, you see these negative inverted P waves uh, present as well. Given that, as well as looking at the frontal plane axis, the P wave axis is normal. Now, these findings in uh, parallel uh, with these constant P wave morphology of all of these throughout, in addition to we looked at all these P to P intervals. This would be a constant P to P interval. So that's the P to P interval. So a constant P to P interval. Um, this suggests sinus rhythm. Okay. So those, again, the constant P wave morphology, the regular P to P intervals, the normal P wave access uh, is uh, sinus rhythm. Now we have to differentiate based on the atrial rate where it actually falls. Well, looking at this, this looks and appears as a regular rhythm. There's a few ways we can find the rate. One sure way, given the standard 12 lead ECG, what we like to use is knowing this is 10 seconds. Well, you could simply multiply that by six to get 60 seconds, which is also equal to one minute. And so if we want to find the atrial rate, and in this case, it will also become the ventricular rate because there are no drop beats and there's good normal conduction. So we would find the number of, again, we'll find the atrial rate, the number of P waves, multiply that by six, and we'll get an estimate of the rate in beats per minute. So if we were to count out these P waves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we have a 11 P waves times six is 66 beats per minute, okay? Uh, and then, in fact, that's exactly what the computer got. Now, because uh, there's a similar number of QRS complexes for each P wave, uh, we would be able to do that and get the ventricular rate, okay? We could also do the same with the P wave. So uh, P waves, and in this case, the QRS complexes. So both the atrial and ventricular rate is 66 beats per minute. So because we have a normal a sinus rhythm with a normal rate, this is in fact si normal sinus rhythm. You may see only sinus rhythm used, and that, if used alone, infers a normal rate. Now, the second, we have to look at the mean QRS axis. That was the second big finding here. Now, the net positive and negative QRS deflections in leads 1 and AVF put us in the left axis deviation range, okay? So, um, and what we then would have to do is look at lead 2, and what we're going to see is that actually puts us beyond negative 30 degrees, favoring a pathologic left axis deviation. So, let's look at the axis here. So how do we find the axis? Well, a few different ways. One simple way is this quadrant method. We know that lead one is here, lead AVF, okay? These are the positive ends of these. This is where zero degrees is, positive 90 degrees, nine, plus or minus 180 degrees, and negative 90 degrees, okay? So if we look here at the axis, or lead one, Notice this is positive, so we're going to head towards lead one. If we look at AVF, this is mostly a negative deflection, so away from the positive end of AVF, and it puts us in this range. Okay, so this is a left axis deviation, but we also know that there are some normal limits, and we want to see if it's beyond negative 30 degrees, because this area here, which we can call one, could also be a normal variant, where this is that true uh, pathologic 
Okay, so how do we find that out? Well, we look at another lead, and we're going to be looking at lead two. Lead two sits down here at positive 60 degrees, so that's at the positive end. What's really convenient about lead two is that its perpendicular lies right here, and so it intersects there at negative 30 degrees, and why that's helpful is because if lead two is positive, okay, it will head towards lead two, the positive end, and put us in the one area, the normal variant. If it is negative, well, it's going to put us in that two section and put us more in a pathologic region. So if we look at lead two here, notice that it is negative. And so that means that the axis is truly in this region. So a true pathologic left axis deviation uh, is present here. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind and it could be further confirmed. Notice that AVL is positive. Okay, so AVL sits over here as well. Uh, lead 3 is negative, so lead 3 is over on this side, so if it's negative, it's going to head also in that direction. So just using the other leads to affirm the axis in that frontal plane. Now, the true um, axis was beyond that negative 30 degrees, okay? Now, uh, if we see that alone, okay, so say you get a pathologic left axis deviation, you should be starting to think of left anterior vesicular block. Now, other findings here that favor this diagnosis include the QR complexes in leads 1 and AVL. So if you look at lead 1, you can see there's a small Q wave, and this is the R wave. Um, and you also see that in AVL, there's a Q wave and an R wave. So that helps to uh, favor that. You see RS complexes in leads 3 and AVF. So if we look at 3, there's an R and an S. And same thing with AVF and R and S complex. So those are, are more supportive features. And if you look at the QRS duration, the QRS duration in this case is actually normal. So there's a normal QRS duration that actually helps to favor that diagnosis of left anterior fascicular block, okay? Now the actual QRS duration here was 78 milliseconds, so within that normal limits. And then we have to exclude other causes of left axis deviation, namely inferior MI. Well, we don't see evidence of inferior MI. We see clear R waves that are, are present in these inferior leads. Okay, also asymptomatic female, so clinical context uh, is important. Left ventricular hypertrophy, we'd want to exclude because that could cause a left axis shift. We don't see that here. Left bundle branch block, we don't see that pattern uh, here as well. A known underlying lung disease or osteum primum atrial septal defect, well, we don't know that. It doesn't, we, we're only given a 64 year old asymptomatic female, so uh, unlikely the cause. So um, we want to then give the diagnosis of left anterior fascicular block. So what an important tip that I want to leave you with is, so we said sinus rhythm is present, we said left axis deviation is present, and left anterior fascicular block, based on what we said, the axis and excluding some of those other features, as well as what we saw in the atrium and lateral leads. Now, if we make this diagnosis of left anterior fascicular block, well, we don't also include left axis deviation because essentially the diagnosis of left anterior fascicular block came as a result of that. So you don't want to over-diagnose that, and so we don't diagnose them together. So the main two we would do is sinus rhythm and left anterior fascicular block. A few final uh, tips here related to left anterior fascicular block. So left anterior fascicular block can result in false positive left ventricular hypertrophy diagnosis from the QRS voltages in leads 1 and AVL, although not the case here. Okay, so 1 and AVL, uh, we don't see, they're not meeting the thresholds uh, in those leads. And another thing is that left anterior fascicular block can mask an inferior MI due to the R waves in leads 3 and AVF, okay, those small ones here. And while left anterior fascicular block and inferior MI can coexist, it's best not to diagnose left anterior fascicular block in the setting of an acute inferior MI unless you see a prior ECG and it shows a left anterior fascicular block. Remember, left anterior fascicular block is a diagnosis of exclusion and inferior MI can cause left axis deviation. So that's an important point that if you have an inferior MI, okay, and, and it's acute or it's an old, and you have these Q waves in those inferior leads, 
right, and it's causing a left axis deviation, you don't also want to code left anterior fascicular block, okay? Remember, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So keep that in mind here, okay? Now, a, a final tip here is don't diagnose left anterior fasciculative block if the cure restoration is more than 100 milliseconds. Now, it's not always the case, but that's a good rule of thumb to keep in mind, two and a half small boxes, except in the setting of a right bundle branch block, okay? Now, unlike left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block does not affect the initial 60 to 80 milliseconds of QRS ventricular activation uh, used to determine the mean QRS axis and identify left anterior fascicular block. So that's an important uh, keep, thing to keep in mind. Uh, remember, shorter QRS duration unless you have concomitant bundle branch blocks present, okay? Uh, so that's pretty much it. That's all we have here. For, so this ECG, our 64-year-old uh, asymptomatic female, the two main findings were that normal sinus rhythm as well as the left anterior fascicular block don't also add left axis deviation. It's already implied in the diagnosis of left anterior fascicular block. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. I hope you found that case helpful. You learned something and took something away that you can use to benefit the patients you care for or even teach it to some of your students. Again, thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't registered, register for free at practice.ekgguy.com or follow us on Facebook uh, and stay in touch.